Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me. Now, several of you have asked why did I, as a Londoner, want to write a biography of Arnold Bennett? Well, I've been a thing of uh, a fan of all things Bennett since my 20s, and I don't live in the Stoke region, but Bennett lives on near my home in North London. Clerkenwell of Riceman Steps is a couple of miles away, but I live much closer to 46 Alexandra Road, and this is, of course, where Bennett first lived when he came to London. Now, as you can see, it's still a house of multiple occupation. There are bells on the door. It's bedsits, just as um, Bennett lived in when he arrived in the capital. He only lived there for a year or so, but that was such a, love, a rough time. That winter was one of the coldest on record. His bedroom was unheated. There were newspaper reports of people skating on Regent's Park, which had specially been flooded. There were ice flows on the upper reaches of the Thames. And every morning, the 20-year-old Bennett faced a four-and-a-half-mile trudge down from Hornsey to um, Lincoln's Inn Field at the fringes of the city for his job as a legal clerk. Buses were just too expensive. Now, this house could qualify for a blue plaque, but there's no commemorative sign. And the only trace of Bennett I stumbled upon, and I've been to this area quite a number of times, I'd never seen it before, but I stumbled on this completely by chance in a short pedestrian alley a couple of hundred yards away on an adjoining street. It was put up in the 60s, I gather from council, but there's no other information about why this is called Arnold Bennett Way. In fact, the local council website only remark is that it's handy for Morrisons. <laughs> now, I don't think that the locals have any idea who, who Bennett was, but his time in Hornsey, in my view, was a crucial, crucially formative period for his life. It formed the backdrop, of course, for, for a man from the north. But it was also this time in Hornsey that it was the one time that Bennett lived among the city clerks and office workers in the North <coughs> London suburbs. And it these ordinary and often downtrodden workers, he wrote so much of his fiction and, of course, his self-help books, his pocket philosophies. But these books, particularly the pocket philosophies, were crafted for, for people living in streets like this. But they were also massive in the United States. And I think one thing people haven't really got fully to grips with is just how big Bennett was in the US. Not just in the years running up to World War I, when he'd spent a lengthy visit there and milestones had just transformed to, to Broadway. He was a best-selling and influential author right to, up to his death in 1931. Now, this is just one of endless newspaper articles. It comes from the Chicago Tribune in 1911 when Bennett was doing his road trip and it, it, it just shows whatever town he went to people had heard of Bennett. They were intrigued by him. It wasn't just his books, it was particularly his self-help uh, books but also his drama and above all, his personality. They just didn't know what to make of him. There was, they were slightly condescending. There was a bit of mickey-taking, a bit of conversation, don't you know. Um, and Bennett did himself no favours at all. He made no compromises. He didn't even bother to see Niagara Falls, which didn't endear himself to Chicago journalists. But he was a big figure. Now, literary London might have looked down upon him, and in particular his pocket philosophies, works such as how, how to live on 24 hours a day, 
and Feast of St. Friend. But when he was in New York in 1911, newspapers called them the work of a prophet and of a preacher and a philosopher. There were simply dozens of newspaper articles describing Bennett as some kind of miraculous self-help guru who could change your life for less than a dollar. And as I said in my book, there were women's clubs in the Midwest during the First World War holding seminars about how to live a simpler and more fulfilled life by studying as um, they might have seen them, the scriptures of Arnold Bennett. And I think there's a lot more research to be done here about how Ch Bennett changed lives outside Britain. Well, he changed lives in Britain as well. But in the rest of the English-speaking world, or empire, as it was called in those days. Last week, I spent a couple of hours on newspapers.com looking at um, newspapers in Australia and newspapers in New Zealand. And you see pretty much the same pattern around this time in the run-up to the First World War. His self-help books were huge. Now, so much of all this research might be interesting in itself, but if it wasn't relevant when I was writing my book, it just had to go. The task I set myself was to try and make Bennett interesting and relevant to the general reader, as I said in my book's forward. And I hope some of the book contains some, a bit of new stuff and some which puts a broader perspective, or adds to, material that's already known. When I took, talk about the material, his journals, this is the 1930 journal, uh, the beginning page um, in the Berg archives in the New York Public Library. It's never been published. This tells you two things. Firstly, he was still making, in today's money, low hundred thousands uh, of pounds. He was, he was still earning it big time. And it also tells you trying to get to grips with his journals of really hard work because his writing, particularly in the original, is almost indecipherable. And it's not just that. In a lot of the original journals, before 1930, big chunk, chunks have been redacted. This is 1929, it was published, uh, Bennett sold it to Castles, but he redacted huge chunks, and most of these seem to in, involve uh, Dorothy Cheston, and we'll come on to her. But if you go back to the earlier journals, and these weren't owned by um, Bennett at the time when he sold the 1929, they'd been given to uh, Dorothy Cheston. She had redacted chunks as well. And it, that goes back to uh, 1928, 1927, 1926. I'm not sure what happened before then because the librarians at the New York Public Library just lost patience with me and I couldn't have any more. So, um, but if we could, uh, um, yeah, if we just leave it there for the moment. Um, but nobody, can, of course, nobody can have the last word in a biography. And I really, really hope that somebody else will take up the baton in, in Bennett biographies sooner or, or later. I find it extraordinary that there hasn't been a Bennett biography since 1974. Uh, uh, if you look at Bennett's circle, H.G. Wells, there have been seven biographies since 1974. There have been three of Lord Beaver's book. There have been simply endless publications about Virginia Woolf. I mean, far too many, in my view. So why was this? There was intellectual snobbery to some extent, social snobbery. Certainly, Bennett has been eclipsed by the cult of Virginia Woolf, modernism and all it stands for. 
And maybe the education system can take some blame. We were chatting um, over coffee before and somebody mentioned that it had been an O-level text in, uh, the old wives' tale had been an O-level text in, 19, in the early 70s. Um, I hadn't been able to find that and I tracked through the exam boards, but it's really interesting. I put a lot of money on Arnold Bennett not being taught in schools for at least since the turn of the millennium. I think the education system has some something to blame. Uh, would Bennett have cared? He once said he's got no interest in his posthumous legacy. He reckoned that only four of his 130 odd books would stand the uh, critical test of time and they were of course The Card, Reisman Steps, Clayhanger and The Old Wives' Tale. I'd add in actually Anna of the Five Towns and, and a few others. But it's those four that you'd expect to see at your, your local Waterstones, and you would. But Bennett, of course, didn't just write great literature. Another reason I decided to write this biography was reading Walter Allen, who said Bennett occupied a position in English life unique among men of letters. Now, that's a huge claim, and it really piqued my interest. At his best, he might be a world-ranking novelist, but he's also, of course, a, a, a dramatist, a journalist, a reviewer, a businessman, a philanthropist, a painter, a pianist, a yachtsman, cigar smoker, dandy, socialite, a personality he mixed with everybody. But when he died, reading through his obituaries, one thing really struck me, and that was dozens of reports of how many letters and telegrams had been sent by right across the country by ordinary people who'd never met Bennett. They weren't part of his circle, but his writing had played such an important part in his life that they wanted to mark the impact that he had had on them. Um, Perhaps Bennett's been so overlooked because he stretched his talent and energies across, across so many different interests. Similarly, the people he was close to was enormous. I could go on about H.G. Wells, one of his key friends. They met before the First World War. When Bennett died in Chilton Court, Marylebone, London, in March 1931, H.G. Um, Wells was a close neighbour. Um, they, uh, they had a huge amount in common, but as Wells explained in his 1935 autobiography, their worldviews di diverged. Wells was interested in, in, in the big macro philosophy, uh, religion, he tried to invent his own religion, economics and science fiction, and Wells thought that Bennett, as he, as, as he grew older, he became more interested in the domestic and the emotional. And in, um, it's, it's interesting that in the First World War, they uh, often dined together at the Reform Club. Uh, they toss a bill to decide who would pay the bill, but they agreed not to discuss fic fiction because they knew they'd always disagree. Um, so I could go on about his, his friendships with Frank Swinnerton, um, his, uh, Pauline Smith, they go on and on. And for the biographer, it's really easy to disappear down a rabbit hole by following too closely all these different trails. And for me, what the, the most important task, I think, was giving due prominence to the, those, I thought, uh, who were the most important and influential characters in his life. And um, when I first started um, writing this book, I thought it's possible to tell Bennett's story just through his wife, his mistress, and Virginia Woolf. I think that is very two-dimensional. It didn't work. You have to talk about his male friends, but particularly you have to add in Lord Beaverbrook. Now, starting at his marriage, Margaret Soulier, 
she was a dressmaker and she loved, and she did this professionally, <coughs> reciting French poetry and she's in the middle of one of her performances here. Now, Bennett married her on the 4th of July, 1907. I think this was a hasty mistake. He was living in Paris at the time. He was wrestling with the plot of the old wise tale. And this was a marriage on the rebound. He'd just been rejected by Eleanor Green. And this put him under pressure because he told his family that he, he would get married by 40. When he, he just about managed to do this with his marriage, marriage to, to uh, Marguerite when he was 39, there was, it was a passionate relationship to begin with, but their two characters were just too different. She was Frenchness personified. As you can see, she, you know, she's quite mannered, uh, emotional, very demonstrative. demonstrative. Bennett was buttoned up, or usually buttoned up, and could be very socially awkward. Beyond the physical, I felt, if you look at their correspondence, that Bennett very largely ignored Marguerite. She often came across as little more than the backdrop. Now, Bennett was described by Margaret Drabble as the kindest of men, and he really was this. But, as I describe in my book, I think he mistreated his wife. During the First World War, the couple lived in some splendour in at Camargue, in Thorpe Socan, Essex. It was, it, it's a Queen Anne house. It's still there. Um, acres of garden. And Marguerite's great dream was to transfer this, this uh, palatial house into her image. She was a very stylish woman. She knew how she wanted the rooms. She knew how she wanted the gardens. But Bennett stripped her of any authority with the servants. He put Winifred Nurney, his secretary, in charge of the running of the estate. And cruelly, Winifred Nurney operated out of an office which was only three rooms down from Marguerite's first floor bedroom in, in the house there. In some ways, his personal assistant had staged a domestic coup. And as Marguerite complains in her letters, she was left with very little to do. Relations between the married couple became pretty stormy. They were often apart during World War I because Bennett was then working uh, as a propagandist in the Ministry of Information. But the state of their marriage, and indeed Bennett's treatment of Marguerite, comes into clear focus uh, from their correspondence, much of which is in Keele University archives. Now, Marguerite spoke pretty patchy English, and she, felt it, uh, she found it hard to keep up with conversations. The couple educated frequently here, people like um, Pinker, J.B. Pinker, uh, his uh, literary agent, they had uh, Frank Swinnerton, they had um, Hugh um, Walpole, um, and Bennett made absolutely no accommodation for Marguerite. She would sit at the table like a lemon, she couldn't keep up. She was ig ignored and belittled. And we know this not just from Marguerite's own diary, which is, again, at Kiel, but from correspondence from regular visitors like uh, Swinnerton or the publisher E.V. Lucas. Uh, but the final straw for Margaret was when Bennett denied her greatest wish, which was to have a child. You'd have thought they'd have sorted this out early on when they got married in 1907. But it was not until 1918 that uh, Bennett told her in a letter that um, he, he thought it was too risky for them to have a baby because of mental infirmities in Marguerite's family. Now, that was denied by Marguerite's relatives. I think his treatment of her was unkind, even cruel. Um, 
it was completely out of character for a man like Bennett. Undoubtedly, Marguerite was irritating. And undoubtedly, Bennett was hugely stretched by the end of World War I, by so many other, th other things. But whatever excuses are made, Bennett was human. He had his failings, as we all do. This was all part of the man. And no one can blame Marguerite for going on to have an affair. Uh, Bennett took ever longer yachting holidays in 1919. He wrote a letter to John Goldsworthy saying, I've been sailing and will do for three more months. I believe I have a wife. This was not a man committed to his marriage. Um, and he could put up with this as long as she was out of his hair and the affair remained discreet. But in 1921, it became public news. The couple's servants caught wind of it. And in late 1921, Marguerite was out on her ear. She always refused to divorce, but Bennett characteristically provided her with a hugely generous settlement. And it was, the cost of it was something towards his later life, he actually f found it difficult to afford. It was at the turn of the 1920s, too, that Beaverbrook became such a big figure in Bennett's life. And I, I really think the influence of this friendship has long been underplayed by other biographers. Uh, Bennett had got to know him when Beaverbrook was in the cabinet. He headed up the Ministry of Information and offered Bennett a job in 1918 as head of propaganda in France. But as personalities, and as friends, they instantly clicked. At this time, Beaverbrook was riding high on, on the boom of mass circulation newspapers with his Daily Express and Evening Standard. He was charismatic, he was ruthless. He was nicknamed the Grinning Goblin by those who didn't like him, and he had a lot of people who didn't like him. Lady Diana Cooper, said that he carried around him the stench of genius, which I think is a kind of good description. And H.G. Wells may do with calling him just the evil Beaverbrook. Uh, but by 1919, Bennett and Beaverbrook were close enough to go on a, a boys' holiday together to Scotland, just the two of them, and the purpose of that was seemingly to try to see if they could... Um, take Beaverbrook's open-top open Rolls-Royce up to 75 mi miles an hour, <laughs> which they did, and there's a cartoon to, by Bennett to commemorate that in the, in the Beaverbrook archives. <clears throat> but it was based on more than that. Uh, Beaverbrook recognised in Bennett something critical, crucial to him as newspaper proprietor. He saw how Bennett was so in tune with the common man he knew what the ordinary person wanted to read. And by the early 1920s, he seemed to have given Bennett a sort of non-executive command of his national titles. It's worth, no, I think it's important to, to note that Beaverbrook's insight into the particular genius of Bennett's ability to understand how the written word would be perceived by its readership was actually repeated completely independently in the memoirs of correspondence of other people who knew Bennett. It's in the memoirs of his American publisher, George Doran. The painter and Bloomsburyite Roger Fry goes on in letters to Bennett during the First World War with comments like, you know, how the public understands so much better than me. And by Ford Maddox Ford, who recalled in his autobiography how his jaw dropped in awe and admiration when he first heard Bennett talk about literature. And I'll just read three lines from Ford Maddox Ford's uh, Return to Yesterday. Uh, he writes, Bennett immediately and again and again gave me the impression 
that he was the wisest man, not only that there ever was, but there ever could be. His pronouncements about writing seem to me of an, of an astounding justness. Now that was just after Bennett had published his book about literature. I've forgotten the title, but it's actually for sale here. And if nobody else wants it, I might buy it myself. Um, but getting back to Beaverbrook, but it was far more than a useful as associate. Beaverbrook was used to sycophants, he was used to yes men, but Bennett would never count out to him. If, if, if Beaverbrook kept him waiting, Bennett would reply in kind the next time, the time they met. And I think Beaverbrook valued Bennett's friendship because he was the only person who treated him as no more than an equal. This friendship lasted from 1919 until Bennett's death in 1931. I think Beaverbrook changed the course of Bennett's life. The opportunity to head up war propaganda in the Ministry of Information, of course, made him a public figure. He was offered a knighthood in 1918. Bennett would never have taken that. In any event, he'd published, he'd, he'd staged the title that year a play ridiculing the honours system. I think for Bennett, the significance of his government service was that it had given him an insight into a world far beyond society, far before, beyond literature. In his own words, he said, this thrilling taste of power was important because I, as a mere artist, shall have had the experience. And Beaverbrook's, um, the relationship with Beaverbrook, I think, was also important because Bennett, up to the end of World War I, had done nothing, absolutely nothing, but work and more work and more work and worry about money. He had never relaxed. And he actually enjoyed Beaverbrook's company. They got the same sense of humour. I think that the years between 1919 and 1921 were some kind of extended gap year or salad days. At this time, Bennett had just bought his uh, second and final yacht, the Marie Marguerite. He had huge amounts of money. And with Beaverbrook, he seemed to spend a lot of it on women. He's rumoured to have spent time with the legendary film star Mae West, although there's no document other, there's only one comment in a side about that in Marguerite's correspondence. I, I'm not sure if it's true. But he certainly spent a lot of times out on the town with various actresses, with Beaverbrook, according to their correspondence in the parliamentary archives. He took it upon himself to invite girls when Beaverbrook said he wanted to dance, and uh, Beaverbrook said that quite a lot. There are a couple of letters where you could almost see Bennett as Beaverbrook's procurer. So was Bennett the same kind of serial philanderer as the owner of the Daily Express, who remains uh, described in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography as an inveterate pursuer of women? Well, Maybe Bennett, perhaps part of him, wanted to be seen as a play, playboy, but I don't think he was at all. One of the most telling comments from those days comes from Harriet Cohen, the pianist, who knew both men really well. She wrote that Bennett was a highly strung, deep-feeling man with a strong feminine streak. Not effeminate, mark you. There was a gusto about him which I think veiled very often the deeper and more sensitive strands in his makeup. I think the main influence on Bennett from, uh, uh, on Bennett from Beaverbrook was on his writing. It was Beaverbrook who nearly sidetracked Bennett from writing Reisman's Steps. That was published in 1923. But its publication was by no means assured. As recently as, as 1922, Bennett was still determined that his next great work will be based on Beaverbrook's father, 
he was a Canadian minister who, when he retired, completely lost his religious faith and started borrowing and spending huge money from his newspaper, newspaper proprietor's son. And Bennett loved this idea. He thought it was a kind of inversion of the parable of the prodigal son. I mean, who knows if this would have worked? Beaverbrook lost interest. He wanted to co collaborate over a, a satirical political novel, Lord Rango, which came out in 1926. Now, from a marketing perspective, this was a red-hot hit. It was a satirical thriller about, about an adulterous minister during World War I. And um, when it was in the run-up to publication in 1926, Beaverbrook's newspapers made it almost a kind of national parlour game. Who was the real Lord Rango? Who was the adulterous minister in the previous war cabinet? And there was a massive amount of press coverage. But I'd still argue this was a diversion in Bennett's literary career. I think... Beaverbrook was one of the reasons that uh, his Bennett's output of top-class fiction during the later 1920s was so thin. But I also think this association, to put a positive spin on it, helped make Bennett such a well-known and influential public figure during the 1920s. And the next character is, of course, and you can't get around this, Virginia Woolf. And I'm not going to go into the minutiae of their endless wrangling about modernism versus realism. I want to look at their personal relationship. Now, the cult of Virginia Woolf is now so great that it's almost a given that Woolf came out on top of Bennett in their 13-year-old feud. But I think if you look at the evidence, this has been distorted by academic hype. I don't think Bennett acknowledged her as any real threat until 1922. Now, the important thing to remember, he was, he was involved in so many other things, his, his plays, his journalism, um, his social life, his business interests. Uh, this was a time which, as Walter Allen said, there was... He was a public figure such as no literary figure has ever been seen before or since. Bennett first met Wolfe at Osbert Osber, Osber Sitwell's house in Swan Walk in Chelsea in 1919. He wasn't impressed. The main thing he remembered, according to his journal, about that meeting was that the guests, and they were an illustrious bunch of writers, was served fish before the food, food course, and Bennett thought that was absolutely wrong, as it is. Um, and in um, 1924, when he published Reisman's Steps, the next significant account, perhaps, was the... Um, when he published Reisman's Steps, he sent it to Wolfe, Wolfe wrote back a letter, and this is probably, as far as I can see, the one piece of correspondence between them. It's in the UCL archives. And characteristically, she damns the book with faint praise, claiming that she'd been able to read the whole thing in less than the morning. By 1926, Bennett clearly realised she was far more of a threat to his reputation than he admitted, he met her again at H.G. Wells's house and he did his best to have a private chat. His journal said he was spoiling for a scrap. Wolf just blanked him. But at that time, Bennett was in a far more posi powerful position to keep the likes of Wolf down. He had just been given a book review column in the Evening Standard which made him, according to a huge piece about this in Encounter magazine in 19, 1960, the most powerful reviewer that there has been or ever will be. Now, th that's, that's a big claim, but if you look at, if you read um, Hugh Walpole, for example, at that time, um, their descriptions of Bennett's column being so important mm -hmm. 
that every Thursday when it came out in the Evening Standard, publishers would send their messengers down to the printing works in Shoe Lane and they grabbed the first edition of the press, which in those days would have been wet, and, and they flicked through to the books and persons column and anything recommended would be bought by practically not only all, all the readers, but, but would be ordered by publishers and, um, and bookshops. According to Hugh Walpole, Bennett was the only person ever who could make or break a writer's reputation forever in just 800 words. A bit of hyperbole, perhaps, but it... Um... In what did this mean for the relationship um, between uh, Wolf and Bennett? Well, in um, the current, Hugh Walpole's current correspondence, which is in the... A, a lot of which is in the excellent archive in the Potteries Museum near here, there's a description of him having tea with um, Walpole, having tea with Wolf in 1928, and she was really fretting what um, Bennett thought of her writing. And it, it seems no co coincidence that her book, Orlando, was just about to be published. And um, if you look at the original manuscript of Orlando and... Um, I'm indebted to Hermione Lee, uh, Wolf's last publisher, for spotting this. In the original um, manuscript, in the introduction, Wolf herself had wrote about her fears that she was a poor scribbler immortalised by Arnold Bennett's brilliant articles. And this was omitted when the book was published, but it kind of shows how... Wolf was perhaps much more daunted by uh, Bennett than she ever left put on. And you feel there's something genuine in the remarks she made in her journal. When Bennett died in 1931, uh, Wolf wrote that she really thought he was a genuine, lovable man. So lastly, we come to the, perhaps in some ways, the most important person in Bennett's life, Dorothy Cheston. She was around 30 when they met in 1921, nine months or so since Bennett separated from Marguerite. She was an actress, she was, she was really talented, and she was phenomenally ambitious. Uh, they met when Dorothy had a leading part in Bennett's Liverpool production of Body and Soul in 1931. And it's really no surprise why Bennett found her so attractive. Uh, she was an actress. He always went for people of the theatre. And she was really attractive. A dazzling blonde, as Frank Swinnerton described her in his memoirs, A Last Word. Uh, but quite extraordinary for a jobbing repertory actress of that time, she had already an in-depth knowledge of Bennett, his works, and um, also knew personally some of the American writers that Bennett admired so much, particularly Thomas Dreiser. And Bennett must have found her backstory as absolutely incredible. It could have made the plot of one of his novels. She was born one of two children. To the, to, um, the father was an architect, relatively well-to-do. But somewhere along the lines, her, her life r ran off the rails a bit, and there are allusions to that in, um, in uh, Dorothy's uh, autobiography published in 1935. But there's no explanation there in that book about why, at the height of World War I, in 1915, aged 24, she arrived in New York, apparently by herself, on the Philadelphia. And if you look at the original uh, disembarkation form, she is described as a medical student. Now, 
there's no way she could have been a medical student. She went to Queen's, which is a school in London, which at that time didn't do public ex exams. It, it would have been really hard for her to qualify. Um, it, this kind of solo passage um, in the middle of wartime w was extraordinary. It's interesting um, that Thomas Pals Cooper was also a passenger on board, and she later the writer and lecturer and poet, and she would later get to know him and his sister well in New York. So perhaps he had helped her with the passage. Um, it's possible to track the start of her theatrical career from 1915 when Dorothy arrives in New York. And it was pretty impressive. Within a couple of years, she had parts in romantic comedies like uh, Cheating Cheaters on Broadway, and she was being reviewed in her own right. She lived in Greenwich Village in uh, part of a bohemian gang of writers, poets, and, and artists. And this was where she first heard about Bennett. It was in 1916, and she was at... Um, Powell's apartment when he just received a telegram from Bennett and H.G. Wells who were offering their support in a campaign he was heading up to oppose the government ban on a supposedly pornographic novel by Theodore Dreiser. Powell's and Dreiser also discuss in, in their journals discussing Bennett's literature with Dorothy. So she had um, a running start when they first met. Bennett could uh, had such a receptive audience. And I think when the relationship started, there was a very strong emotional connection. Um, this was a, uh, I think it's a 1923. It's the only, if you call it a love letter, this was a love letter from Bennett to Dorothy Cheston. It's very different from almost all of their other uh, very transactional um, communication. They clearly had their own kind of code and they had sort of pet nicknames for each other and uh, Bennett's drawn this kind of fantastical character with... Um, Long, he puts LG long earrings. He does other pictures. I, I wouldn't be a, a, um, some writing for his later um, his later daughter, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if somewhere there's not some children's literature written by Bennett, although I've never found it. Um, but in most of his correspondence when they were courting each other it was as if Bennett was trying to negotiate a business deal which in a lot of ways he was he would enjoy intimate companionship in return for offering Dorothy who was um, 14 years his uh, junior um, patronage in advancing her career in the theatre and given his standing as a playwright, this was something he was very able to do. But there was never any mention of children. And just as he'd, um, he, he'd told Marguerite he wouldn't have a child, um, presumably that was, just, that was what he told um, Dorothy. But uh, whatever, she told him in 1926 that she was pregnant they were having a child. I think, actually, for Bennett, this was the best thing about their relationship. He always said he never wanted children, and he never published anything about it. But th there is one existing side diary. It's called Some Incidents, and that's another of his um, uh, manuscripts in the Berg Library in the New York Public, in the Berg Collection, the New York Public library and he describes himself as being excited as it possible for me to be and then he goes on to say despite this excitement he was worried 
to paraphrase how Dorothy would make out as a, as a mother. And by this time, 1926, the relationship was tem tempestuous. Um, doubtless, Bennett was irritating to live with, but on the surface, their house was en enviable. They lived at 75 Cadogan Square, huge house in Belgravia. But even for, despite all this, Dorothy was, was restless. Her career wasn't going quite to plan. She decided she wanted to be not just an actress, but an imp impresario. Her first venture in 1927 was Bennett's own, a dramatisation of Bennett's own novel, Mr. Prohack. And apart from directing it, she, she had a star part. Now, she made a big mistake because she had cast Charles Loughton in his first uh, big West End role to play opposite her. Now, of course, Charles Loughton went on to be such a megastar in film and theatre, and all the reviews were focused on him, and, um, uh, and Dorothy was certainly diminished by that. Now, she went on staging shows. Bennett was still earning big bucks, but even his budget had his limits. And then Dorothy did something extraordinary. To Bennett's horror, she started trying to borrow money from Beaverbrook. He didn't often put his foot down, but this time he did. This was his best friend. And he thought it's absolutely shameful to drag Beaverbrook in, in, into this mess. It was on Sunday, 30th, 30th of November, 1930, that um, Dorothy wrote a letter which I think you can only really describe as treacherous. It's quite interesting if you look at the date, Queen's Gate, SW7. What, why was she writing from there? The couple at that time lived in Chilton Court. But as you can see, She's talking about the predicament that we are in, which is now becoming acute. On the next pages, she goes, she needs more money for Virginia. But she's also going behind Bennett's back and appointing her, I've been bound, being in a sense Arnold's representative here. She wanted to borrow money from Beaverbrook. She told Beaverbrook that uh, Bennett had asked her to write his biography, which was inconceivable at that time. And she, if you think, why did she, why did she do this? What, why did she need this, this money? Well, this was a time According to Bennett's journal, she had told him three times that she planned to leave him and to take Virginia away to make a new life in New York. She painted herself in a very different light in the aftermath of Bennett's death in 27th of March, 1931. Now she was a dutiful widow. As I explore in my book, none of his family, nor indeed his friends, was really convinced about this. The main positive thing about this relationship was a daughter with whom he was besotted. At around the, this time, Bennett described it, there were f frequent ven uh, um, references to Virginia in his letters. He'd, he'd say things like, I play a lot with Virginia and she is a great waste of my time. Uh, he, he really loved his daughter. And if you, if you sum all this up, I think just as the feud with Virginia Woolf tarnished his legacy, I think Dorothy Herses Cheston herself played some part in rewriting uh, sections of Bennett's life. I found it interesting that the last three biographers um, thanked Dorothy profusely for her part in contributing to her work. And it wasn't just 
the relationship. Dudley Barker, in 1966, said he had relied on Dorothy for her guidance and, and, and advice on Bennett's entire life. Now, uh, Dorothy had her strengths, she was very talented, but I think uh, she was not a reliable witness. Now, Bennett achieved so much in his life. He was, as Walter Allen said, occupied a position in English life unique among English men of letters. He was far more than a novelist. He was an iconic figure of his age. But there is so much of his life and times that remains relevant and relatable to us today. Thank you very much.